I'd like to read uh, from Galatians 3 this afternoon, because we'll be dealing with uh, Brackle's view on the covenant, also in the Old Testament. And so, um, of course, Galatians 3 is a pivotal chapter where the Apostle Paul uh, establishes the connection between the Old Testament and New Testament believers. So I want to begin with Galatians 3, verse 6. Galatians 3, verse 6. Let's hear God's word. Even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. So as we will see later, Brockle argues that Believers in the Old Testament were as much believers as they are in the New Testament. And that's very clear. All believers are the spiritual sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham. Remarkable statement. Saying, in thee shall all nations be blessed. Genesis 12 verse 3. Right? So... By inspiration, Paul is telling us that is the gospel. So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is every one that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident, for the just shall live by faith. And the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree. That the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles. So the point Paul is making, that the blessing that we have received in salvation is the exact same blessing he received. It's the same blessing through Jesus Christ that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Brethren, I speak after the manner of men. Though it be but a man's covenant, yet if it be confirmed, no man disannulleth or addeth thereto. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not unto seeds, as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. Beautiful illustration of the verbal plenary inspiration of Scripture, that even the plurals matter, right? And Paul here makes a very important point of doctrine by distinguishing between singular and plural. And this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ the law which was 430 years after cannot disannul that it should not make the promise of none effect. So Paul is saying what happened at Sinai did not replace what happened when God made a covenant with Abraham. But he refers to this covenant as a covenant that was of God in Christ. Okay. For if the inheritance of the law be of the law... It is no more of promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of transgressions, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made, and it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Now a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. And we're going to talk about the covenant of works, right, and its demand. But the scripture has concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore, the law. And um, Brockle clearly argues that... Paul is here not referring to the moral law. He's referring to the ceremonial law. So the ceremonial law was a pedagogue, that's what the Greek says, was a teacher to bring us unto Christ. That we might be justified by faith. Which was God's objective in giving the ceremonial worship. He thereby 
taught Israel that salvation was by faith in Christ. But after that faith has come, we're no longer under a schoolmaster. In other words, now that Christ has come, we no longer need that pedagogue, okay, as the children of Israel did. And so he says, for you are all the children of God by faith in Jesus Christ. And we'll end the reading of God's word there. Would you ask for a blessing? Sure. Yeah. Heavenly Father, Lord, we pray to invite your presence to our meetings um, this afternoon. Lord, um, open our minds and our hearts to your teaching, to your word um, in the midst of us. Give us a humble heart to listen to your voice so that we may become more and more like Christ and we may become more and more closer to you. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So last time we began uh, considering Brockle and the Covenants, and we addressed his teaching on the Covenant of Redemption, uh, that eternal counsel, and he gave three uh, significant scripture passages to support this whole idea of the Covenant of Redemption, very helpful. And we looked at the Covenant uh, of Works as well, the, um, the Covenant that God made with Adam. And even though the term itself is not found in Scripture, Brockle argues repeatedly, especially in these chapters, that the idea is very scriptural. It's a, um, uh, the term covenant of works was obviously a term that was coined by theologians. But what they are simply expressing in that term is that in that original covenant, God promised eternal life upon obedience. He promised eternal life upon the doing of good works, which is the obedience to his law, right? And that's why Brockle argues, as we will see again as we now pick up in chapter 13, that our understanding of that is crucial. He's arguing if we don't grasp what the covenant of works is all about, we cannot grasp what the covenant of grace is all about. We cannot grasp what the essence of salvation is all about. So beginning at chapter 13, then we're on page 16 of the syllabus. Um, he says this, Nevertheless, this covenant remains in full force obligating the entire human race, that is, all who have not been translated into the covenant of grace, to obedience and subjecting men to punishment, since the fulfillment of the promise continues to be contingent upon obedience. Okay? And that's why, as we will see later, that's why the very essence of Christ's ministry as mediator is obedience. His active obedience and his passive obedience, the obedience that he rendered in his suffering, which is what the word passive means. And so, as I love to quote J.C. Ryle, J.C. Ryle makes this beautiful, simple statement that we are saved because of the doing and the dying of Jesus. That's it, the doing and the dying, right? So, Brock goes on. This do and thou shalt live. That's the fundamental requirement that God placed before Adam. Although man cannot attain the promise since he does not fulfill the condition, the promise nevertheless remains part and parcel of this covenant. This is really critical. Okay. And again, this, this kind of formulation hopefully shows you that though this systematic theology is very devotional in character. He was a very capable theologian who was able to very 
carefully and precisely articulate the important truths of Scripture. And that's why this book will be a valuable resource for you, not only in terms of learning how you apply Scripture in a very practical way, how you preach, how you bring it uh, to your hearer, but it will be a great resource in terms of systematic theology as well. However, he goes on, when God permits man to exit the covenant of works and enter into the covenant of grace, he is no longer under obligation to that covenant. And that's a very important point. That's the beauty of the covenant of grace. Is that the gospel tells us that we ourselves no longer have to fulfill that obligation. And that what we can no longer fulfill has been fulfilled in Christ. And that's why it is a gracious covenant. For you are not under law, but under grace. For if the first husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. Romans 7.2 To the believer, the law is no longer a condition of the covenant of works, but a most desirable rule of life. And so when God gives the law at Mount Sinai, he is not setting before Israel the covenant of works. This is in the context of the covenant of grace, and, and Brockel argues that in, in detail. Although he said, Brockel does say this, he said God gave the law in the form of the covenant of works, but it was within the context of the covenant of grace. Because God gave the law after he redeemed them. Not before. After he redeemed them from Egypt. Then he gave the law. And that's why the preamble of the law is, I am the Lord your God. And because I am the Lord your God, therefore. Right? So, that's why Brockel says here, the law is no longer a condition of the covenant of works, but a most desirable rule of life. Thus, when he sins, that is the believer, he no longer breaks the covenant of works as he's no longer obligated toward it. Rather, he sins against his most desirable rule of life, which has been given to him in the covenant of grace. Such sin is not committed by the new man within, but by the flesh which remains in him. And although these sins themselves are worthy of punishment, believers shall not be subjected to punishment since the surety has taken their sins upon himself and has fully paid their debt. So whereas the covenant of works had been broken and rendered impotent so that felicity was no longer to be obtained by it, and the covenant of grace had replaced this covenant for believers, God did not want Adam to yearn for the covenant of works as or its sacrament, the tree of life. Right? So Brockle clearly belonged to those who viewed the tree of life as being sacramental. As a, so what is a sacrament? It is a visible affirmation of divine revelation. Right? And so the tree of life was a visible affirmation of the promise of the covenant of works. So what does Brockle say? So he said, this covenant, now that Adam had fallen, this covenant was no longer efficacious. What Brockle simply means to say is this, and he unpacks that elsewhere. He's simply, he's simply saying, from that moment on, that man fell, salvation can no longer be obtained by way of the covenant of works. So why? So Bacchus goes on to say, rather, he says, the Lord wanted them to turn from this covenant, putting all their hope and seeking all their comfort in the promised seed of the woman. And that, Bacchus says, is the reason why God now barred the, guard, the gate. He barred it so that they could not reach the tree of life any longer. Because salvation could no longer be obtained in that way. So in that sense, you could say that in the covenant of grace, Christ is now our tree of life. Christ is now the one through whom we obtain salvation. That's what makes it so remarkable that um, the gate of the tabernacle and the temple was on the east. Right? So here it's on the east of the Garden of Eden that the way to God is barred by the cherubims as being the, uh, 
the ones who uphold divine justice, the way is barred. But then God unveils how in Christ the way is open again. Right? In the east. Cast out of the presence on the east side of the garden. And then God shows us that through the east there is a, is a way back into his presence again. Anytime you guys have questions or if you want to make a comment, an observation, uh, please feel free to do so. Then we're switching to volume four. Um, in volume four, you will find um, appendices in which Brockle again addresses the doctrine of the covenant and especially what his primary focus in these appendices is, is to argue that the church of the Old Testament is one and the same church as the church of the New Testament, right? And so he is, of course, in these appendices, he is addressing what he feels the aberration in the teaching of Coxaeus. Coxaeus, whom he feels did not correctly understand the nature of God's covenant dealings in the Old Testament. Okay, so um, in these appendices, he... Um, basically covers the various stages in which God unveils this covenant. Right? The period from Adam to uh, Abraham. Okay? And then we see that God um, separates Abraham and his family. So then we have the Abrahamic administration of that covenant. And that brings us to Sinai, from Abraham to Sinai. And then from Sinai until uh, Christ, uh, until finally with Christ we have the worldwide. So it goes from individual, God makes his covenant with individuals, then with a family, Abraham and his seed, then with a nation. So the circle gets bigger, gets bigger, and then finally he, it becomes worldwide in its administration. Yeah, to, uh, until the coming of Christ. That is, the, that is the national, we call that the national administration of the covenant of works, right? So, because after Christ finishes his work, right, then on the day of Pentecost we see that the boundaries are now broken. It's no longer for Israel alone, right? Salvation is now for the world, it's for the Gentiles. Yeah. Of course, there are, there are a number of covenants, right? But what the, the point he is making in these articles, the overarching covenant, there's ultimately, there's only one covenant, even though there were various forms. But ultimately, the, 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 what Brockle argues in these appendices, there is one covenant of grace. See? And that's a fundamental truth of the Reformed faith. That's the strength of the Reformed faith, right? Is that though we have two testaments, we have one Bible. We have one covenant. We have one way of salvation. We have one Savior. And we have one church. Right? Yes. Because of a personal curiosity, um, it is not a, a different covenant, but um, we can see some different elements of the same covenant. Right. Oh, certainly, certainly, there is progression. Right? There's progression because when God establishes it with Abraham, he introduces the sacrament of circumcision. Right? When he establishes that covenant with the whole nation of Israel, he introduces the ceremonial law, which Abraham did not have. The whole ceremonial worship becomes part of that administration of the covenant. Right? Until Christ comes uh, and fulfills all of that. Right? And then the veil is rent. Right? To symbolize that that administration of the covenant had now ceased because Christ had fulfilled it. So let's, let's just walk through these appendices and, and see once some of the uh, remarkable things that Brockel uh, says here. So, yeah? Just for our understanding, we are going to volume 4. Yeah, those, because, be, be, because I see I, what, what I'm doing here, I'm bundling together what Brockel has said in the covenants. Okay. So he has those early chapters, 
But those appendices are also very helpful. And the reason those appendices are helpful for you is because uh, we are surrounded by dispensationalism. Right? And Brockle clearly uh, dispels with that whole notion. I don't think we can accuse Coxeus of being a dispensationalist, but I think sometimes in Coxeus's a view of the Old Testament that the seeds were there, right? He, I don't, I, you can't call uh, Coxeus a dispensationalist, right? But the idea of dispensationalism was already beginning to surface, and so Brackle hammers away at this and saying, no, no. He's saying, right? So, and, uh, so yeah? Since he's a uh, he's a Dutchman, he, do you know of any any group that is yes. that can really, yes. when I read it, I would really say, okay. If you want to, if you want to grasp yeah. uh, Do Dr. Van Asselt, so if you go, if you actually Google the name Coxeus, yeah. um, it will bring you to Wikipedia, yeah. and then Wikipedia gives you a link yeah. to the dissertation by Dr. Van Asselt about Coxeus' theology, and that's in English. And actually, it's, it's available on Google Books. Oh, it's, it's upstairs in the library. Okay. okay. Yeah, so you'll find it in the library. But the, um, so, <laughs> that's how you spell his name. And the, uh, the author is uh, Dr. Van Asselt. He is the world's foremost authority on Coxeus. And so, and his book is in English. So, if you want to learn more about Coxeus, go find the book. <laughs> All right. Okay. But this, this, you know, to, to have to know a little bit about Coxeus is, is helpful in terms of knowing why Brockle addresses certain things, right? I mean, um, Coxeus certainly contributed significantly to the development. Of, of covenant theology, that's for sure, right? But uh, unfortunately, there were aberrations, okay? So, Brockle says this, the Old Testament or covenant encompasses the entire period from the gospel declaration in paradise until Christ. During this entire time frame, there was no diversity in its manner of administration. An administration which functioned during this entire period by way of promises and figures. However, relative to the subjects of this administration, we can make a chronological distinction between the church prior to Abraham and thereafter. Prior to Abraham, the church consisted of various nationalities, as is true in the New Testament era. However, God took Abraham and his seed to be his church. Thus, subsequent to Abraham's time, other nations rapidly became estranged from true religion. And I think what he's simply saying that even post-flood, right, the, um, the, 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 the descendants of the sons of Noah represented the nations of the world. Right? That's what you find in Genesis 10. Genesis 10, right? Uh, which makes the promise made to Abraham so remarkable that though all of these nations became estranged from God, that he says to Abraham, but in you, all the nations that are mentioned in Genesis 10, all those nations will be blessed in you, right? And we are the living proofs of that today, okay? However, so thus subsequent to Abraham's time, other nations rapidly became estranged from true religion, Thus, this pure religion was preserved, however, among the descendants of Abraham. Therefore, when speaking of a national covenant, it must be understood as the covenant of grace established with that particular notion. And then he says this, and this is so important, the term does not imply more than that. Right? Because there are those today uh, who argue that that national covenant was substantially different from the New Covenant, right? And we'll get to that terminology, Old and New Covenant. Uh, Brockle addresses that, right? And all Brockle is saying here, and correctly so, is that when we talk about a national covenant, it simply means that at that particular phase of redemption history, God made that covenant with 
the nation as an entity. That nation was the church. That was the church, also in its visible form. So a little bit later on in his answer to this question, I just can't read all of this, we don't have the time for it, we respond in the first place by saying, okay, the question is this, did the Old Testament begin with the first promise in paradise? Or did it begin at Mount Horeb, consisting in the inheritance of Canaan as a type of heaven? So he says, we respond in the first place by saying that scripture does not make a distinction between covenant and testament, since the one word, bereath, the Hebrew word is used in the Old Testament, and the word diateke is used in the New Testament. And so he's saying, he's arguing that whole paragraph, those two terms refer to the same thing, the same covenant. So however he says, at the, in the last sentence, as we have shown in the appropriate place, the distinction between covenant and testament is unfounded. Okay. Again, you can find this uh, uh, unpacked in detail as you read this, okay? So, um, so we have thereby demonstrated that the Old Testament did not begin at Sinai, but with Adam, and that the Old Testament did not consist in the inheritance of Canaan. Consequently, in other words, more than that, right? That Canaan was but a type of that inheritance, okay? Um, so the entire period, he says, from Adam to Christ is the time of promise. So what the Apostle says of the fathers of the Old Testament in Hebrews 11.13 is most certainly true for the believers of that time. This is critical, critical verse here. These all died in faith. All of the people that I mentioned in Hebrews 11. All these Old Testament saints, they died in faith. Not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and they embraced them. Okay? The same faith. That's the point of Galatians 3. Abraham's faith was the same faith as our faith. By that faith, he was justified. He believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. He was justified on the basis of imputed righteousness. That's why Jesus said about Abraham, He saw my day, and he rejoiced. Right? Ryan. When Abraham was talking about the same faith, I would presume he's specifically talking about the same content of faith, because the dispensationals will come in and make that little caveat and get around it. The same content... The same object of faith. Does he go through that? In oh, he does. Those appendices are, if you, th those are so good. Uh, you know, he really addresses that in detail. Yeah, I'm just giving you highlights here. So the next appendix deals with the period of Abraham to Sinai. Okay. So the, this raises the following question. Brockholm says, is the covenant made at Horeb, the covenant of grace itself? Or is it a national, external, and typical covenant having as its only promise the inheritance of Canaan? And is thus the point at which the Old Testament commences? We answer as follows. It is the covenant of grace itself. The transaction is but a solemn renewal of that covenant of which all believers since Adam have been partakers. God renewed this covenant with Abraham and his seed, confirming it with the sacrament of circumcision. And that's why, brothers, the sacrament of circumcision was not merely of national significance. It was not. The sacrament of circumcision was the sacrament of the covenant of grace. That's what Galatians 3 tells us clearly. Okay? It was a visible affirmation of that covenant. In every circumcision, God affirmed the covenant of grace. That's why it applied to girls too. Uh, Baptists are fond of raising that point and say, well, uh, what about girls? They weren't circumcised. Well, of course, the nature of circumcision was that they couldn't be circumcised. But this, the, the circumcision of the boy was but a means to an end. It was but the means whereby God visibly affirmed his covenant, a covenant that applied to boys and to girls as well. They were comprehended in it as well. Okay, I am your God and the God of your seed. And the reason why the males were circumcised is because the organ of 
generation was circumcised to indicate that sinners can only produce a sinful seed. You see? But that God has found a way through the seed of the covenant, of which, of which Paul speaks, through the seed of the covenant, there is salvation for a sinful human race that can only produce a sinful seed. Right? That's the whole issue that's communicated. So, um, in, the, in, the, in the, the second paragraph there, uh, in the previous chapter he has proven, he says that the Old Testament began with the very first promise in paradise. Consequently, in other words, Genesis 3.15 is the first gospel sermon preached by God himself. God was the first one to declare the gospel. Right? And that's where it begins. Consequently, he says, it follows with equal certainty that the contrast between the Old and New Testaments cannot be one of essence. They, okay, it, the, the contrast is one of administration, but not one of essence. The essence is the same. So people, the last sentence there, people were indeed saved and did possess all the benefits of the covenant of grace in the Old Testament. And see, the point is when you deny that, whether you like it or not, but you become implicitly a dispensationalist, then what you're doing is you're erecting a wall between Old and New Testament. Right? And... That's simply a fundamental misunderstanding of how those two testaments relate. That's why I love the statement that the Puritans called the two testaments the two lips of God. One mouth and two lips. Okay? So when we don't let those two lips function together, you get distortion. I mean, just try to hold your lip, one lip, and, start, and try to talk. It doesn't make, you know, it doesn't work very well, right? Those two lips have to function they have to, and they're synchronized, right? Because the New Testament is the apostolic exposition of the Old. It's the crowning piece of the Old. It's the final chapter of the Old. It doesn't deny the Old Testament or replace the Old Testament. It's the, it's the icing on the cake, if you will. That's what the New Testament is. In the time of Braco, it seems that the issue of the... Ten Commandments in Mount Sinai, like now they always say, is a republication of the of, of the covenant of works. Maybe in his own time, it, he didn't even give it much time. The issue was more of between the old and the new, and he was trying old. to show that yeah. it's just one. Yeah. Very much so, and he had to do that because of Coxeus' influence, right? right? And, and so we benefit from that today. But already in his day, there were also people who were interpreting the law, the Ten Commandments, the Fourth Commandment, all of that, right? Uh, very much. In that sense, there is nothing new under the sun. Right? And the same errors, the same um, aberrant thoughts, they somehow find a way of resurfacing. Uh, maybe dressed a little differently, but it's the same. Right? So we, in our day too, there are those who would have us believe right, that the fourth commandment is no longer uh, binding uh, the, uh, upon the New Testament Christian. Well, Brockle does a wonderful job of dismantling that argument in his chapter. You know, um, when, he, when you deal with the fourth commandment. Yeah, I, I dealt with it and yeah. it was troubling me. So, Bracco also dealt with it too. Yes, he does. Okay. Oh, yes, he does. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, in the, in the third paragraph there, he says this, relative to its administration. I want to emphasize the word administration. That's a key word here. It is a new covenant, oh, he, he addresses it for the first time, which has its beginning with the suffering, death, resurrection, and ascension of Christ. As far as essence was concerned, this covenant was one and the same as the old covenant. Okay, brothers, this is a fundamental truth that's mis un misunderstood today. Okay? Yes, Jeremiah 31 and Hebrews 8 talks about a new covenant. But it's not a replacement covenant. What's new about it is the, the way it's administered. 
that's totally new. It's the, the, a complete, uh, the, the complete abolition of, of the ceremonial law, the ministry of shadows, has been abolished. There's no more shedding of blood, none of that. So in that sense, it is new. So the administration differs. But the, Paul, the point, Bracco argues, is that the essence is the same. Right? Hmm? Are you now in Appendix 4? Yeah, I'm, I'm, no, I just finished, uh, I'm looking at the third paragraph of, of Appendix 2 there. Okay? So as far as S is what's concerned, okay. Um, so it is a gracious covenant, he says, which pertains to heavenly benefits and a heavenly inheritance and begets free and heavenly children. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. Galatians 4.26. This covenant, administered in a new manner, is so very fruitful in bringing forth free and spiritual children. So then in Appendix 4... Um, he deals, let me see if, that, if I have that right there. Just a second here. Yeah, the, the full title is The Nature of the Suretyship of Jesus Christ During the Old Testament. That's the focus of... Of, um, in other words, the point is this. Was Christ, during the Old Testament, was he the surety of believers in the same sense that he's ours? Right? So he says the difference of opinion consists in this. The common sentiment among the Reformed is that the suretyship of the Lord Jesus in the Old Testament was identical to that of the New Testament. He has taken upon himself and removed all the sins of all the elect. And thus also of all Old Testament believers. For the purpose of rendering payment for them by his suffering and death. Old Testament believers have thus been as free from guilt and punishment as are New Testament believers. And how does Paul argue that in Romans 4? How does he do that? How does Paul argue that? Who does he use to illustrate the doctrine of justification? Abraham and? Who else? Blessed is he whose sins have been forgiven. And David, right? Abraham and David. He uses two Old Testament saints to illustrate the doctrine of justification by faith. Because they were justified in the same way that we are justified. Okay? So... There is one single covenant of grace, he goes on, which is and remains the same from Adam until Christ coming unto judgment. Right? One. A covenant in which all partakers have an equal portion and the same rights, and of which Jesus Christ is the surety. Since there is but one covenant and one surety, and all the partakers of the covenant have equal rights and partake of this covenant in the same way, Christ must also be the same surety at all times, and his suretyship must be of the same efficacy both before as well as after his actual satisfaction. Ryan. Does the Bracco deal with uh, Acts 1730? Uh, times of their ignorance, God winked at. Um, you know, I can't say it with absolute certainty, but having volume. Yeah. Having volume 4 here, let me just see, Acts 17, um, yeah, he, he deals with that particular context in, in volume 1, chapter 14. Um, Yeah, but I, th I think what Paul is saying there in that sermon is that in all of history up till that moment, right, the world did dwell in darkness, and in that sense God seemed to wink at it. But now that the gospel is being published throughout the world, he's commanding man everywhere to repent, right? That command to repentance never went to those nations. 
Paul is saying at the Areopagus, they're you know, standing in the middle of Greece and Athens, that this command is now being proclaimed to all men everywhere. Okay. Um, so he goes on to say, um, see the point Brockle is making is this, men, God can accept sinners only on the basis of one foundation, and that is the sacrifice of his son. God doesn't have two standards. And that's the inherent problem of dispensationalism. Dispensationalism teaches us that God, in a given dispensation, deals with man fundamentally different than he does in another dispensation. And the argument that Paul makes, that's not so. Or that Bronco makes, is not so. So, in other words, believers in the Old Testament were saved by the same surety. He had not come yet. They anticipated him, but they were saved in the same way. Abraham saw my day, and he rejoiced. Christ himself tells us that, right? So the apostle states in express terms that Christ was the same surety. In the New Testament, Jesus Christ the same yesterday and today and forever. We often quote that text, but a careful study, and I recommend that you preach on it sometime, is that the apostle in Hebrews, and you know very well what he's trying to do in the book of Hebrews, he's saying all those ceremonies that are so precious to you, they were all about Christ. So the Christ we worship today is the same Christ that was revealed yesterday. It's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So it, remains, it pertains to the past, the days of the Old Testament, when those who are alive, of whom the Apostle states in verse 7, that we should follow their faith and consider the end of their conversation. Remarkable, is it not? Follow the faith of the Old Testament believers, the Apostle is arguing. Um, today pertains to the present time, the days of the New Testament, and he will be forever, the future state. Okay, next page. Uh, so the Old Testament believers were saved and translated into heaven immediately upon their death. Okay, even Christ taught that clearly in the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. When he used an expression that was commonly used that believers would be carried into the bosom of Abraham. And he uses that, right, in his... Um, um, in that particular parable, right? And we know that, of course, uh, of Enoch and of Elijah, right? Um, so Brockle says at the end there, it would be contradictory to suggest that they would be saved in heaven while they were still subject to guilt and punishment, fearing the possibility of expulsion. They were no longer subject to guilt and punishment, Okay. Thus, he says in the next paragraph, in the Old Testament, the Lord Jesus was a vicarious surety in the absolute sense of the word. Okay. Then again, the, the last sentence of the next paragraph, it thus follows that believers in the Old Testament, as far as the essence of the matter is concerned, have been in the same state of reconciliation, sonship, peace, and friendship with God as have believers in the New Testament. That's why Jesus said to the citizens, to the Sadducees, God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's not the God of the dead. He's the God of the living. In other words, those three men were in the presence of God. And on what basis? Bronco argues on the basis of the anticipated sacrifice of the Lamb of God who was slain from the foundation of the world, right? And then finally, Appendix 5, um, the full title is The State of Old Testament Believers. So this is where he really unpacks this, right? Um, again, he makes the same point in, towards the end of the first paragraph. The contrast does not pertain to the manner itself between Old and New Testament believers, but rather to the administration and the degree of application. The agreement lies herein. 
the covenant of grace and all its benefits is as much a reality in the New Testament church as it had been in the Old Testament church. So he goes on to say, in Hebrews 11.39, all these matters are as we have stated them to be. And these all having obtained a good report through faith. What was the object of their faith? None other than Christ, who had then been promised and who now had come. Abel's eye was upon Christ when he sacrificed, for he obtained witness that he was righteous. So I'm convinced that the issue with Abel and Cain was not that somehow Abel had a better disposition of heart. Abel came before God with the bloody sacrifice, and Cain refused. Cain, Cain was hostile to the gospel of the bloody sacrifice. So he came, he refused to come before God, right? But Abraham believed in that bloody sacrifice. This could have not occurred in any other way but by a faith which looked unto Christ. The faith of Enoch, who was taken up, looked unto Christ. Abraham's faith looked unto Christ, the promised seed, and thereby he was justified. Moses looked unto Christ, whereby he esteemed the reproach of Christ the greatest of all riches. For this Christ they all yearned that even though they did not receive him in the flesh, they nevertheless saw him from afar, believed in him, and embraced him. So, let us consider all the things mentioned together, Brackel says. Those who have Jesus as their vicarious surety. Those who have complete forgiveness of sins, Psalm 32. Those who have an act of faith in God through Christ, which engenders peace and joy. Those whom God calls his friends and children, dealing with them in a familiar manner as one would with children. Those who address God in Christ with the name Father. Those who have fellowship with God as their Father in a familiar, sweet, soul-satisfying manner and delight themselves in Him, those most certainly have the spirit of adoption. Old Testament believers had all the aforementioned, however, and thus they did not have the spirit of bondage, but rather a childlike disposition and the spirit of adoption. Yeah. So, nice topic for a paper. <laughs> Does uh, Rockwell deal with the, uh, the Spirit in the Old Testament? Because I know that's also a... The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. Uh, Obviously, regeneration, yeah, there's going to be the same... I can't tell you right offhand. Uh, I want to be careful here. But this kind of stuff is woven all through the Christmas Reasonable Service. It, it is part of the fabric. Right? He highlights it here, but it's all part of the fabric. So I'd have to reread the chapter on the Holy Spirit, but I'm, I'm certain uh, that he points out uh, that they were indwelt as much, and that's, that's easy to prove scripturally as well. Okay. Anyway, our time is up. Okay. All right. And the next uh, lecture uh, will be uh, very interesting. What Brockel has said on, on the church, the doctor of the church, it's going to be very interesting. Very interesting, yeah. How also what he says about the distinction between visible and invisible church. A lot of good stuff. Okay, next week I'm not here. So that means the week thereafter we have a double session. Okay, next week I hope to be in England, the Lord willing. Uh, all right. Brother, would you close with a word of prayer for us? Yeah.
Amen.